Good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure. I'm calling the team to order. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I forgot about this part. Okay. Uh, first, we have public comments, and I draw your attention to the written public comments. Uh, the first comment is from a member of the committee who could not be here today with reference to the agenda, item number eight. Um, the response to that is from me. Um, sorry, I did not sign it. I just sent it in on my email. Uh, so the, the response is, is from the chair. Um, this was a, about what the remit is for us as a, as a group. And in my response, I point out that, that basically we did not limit ourselves to any specific uh, topics that might be covered by the PDC. We are responding in this meeting to a request for our input um, on an issue that they have taken up. So that is what the agenda item is about. If there are any questions about that, um, let me know. Okay, no other comments? <laughs> Has everybody had a chance to look at the agenda? Okay, um, may I have a motion to read the agenda? Anybody second it? Second. Thank you. Okay, the agenda is approved. Uh, summary minutes of the March meeting. Has everybody had a chance to look at the minutes? They were sent out online. I need an approval of the minutes. So moved. Do you have a question? Um, a modification. Although I was not present for the meeting, there was phrasing in the, uh, the motion about hearing none, so and so moved such and such. The, the hearing none is extremely. Yeah, we know. It's, it's hearing none is referring to not hearing any objections, but since nothing is, it's, it's, nobody says anything, you don't need to say it. So you can just say. Thank you, so Mark. Thank you. So were you seconding the minutes, or you're, you, you <laughs> are <laughs> here? So we need another, we need a second from someone. Okay, thank you. Okay. We are fast. Okay. Um, I'm going to give a very brief report. I attended the last Missouri PPO meeting in May. Um, it was, as usual, overwhelming. Um, we covered, it covered, in addition to all the updates from the various committee members, um, it, it covered uh, the regional express lanes update, the regional connector study, and the state of transportation 2018 update. It was a lot of information. Um, I was particularly taken by the connector study, um, and for I, I would like to note that for people in Chesapeake and Suffolk, especially because of the Bowers Hill interchange, you might want to pay some attention to that. I've spoken to our city engineers and planning people, um, and raised uh, they raised some issues that I I looked at at the beautiful pictures of all this, and it was like looking at a spaghetti western. It was just there's so much going on, and my immediate response to that was, what's the impact on our roads? What's the impact on the people who live around there? So um, I would suggest that, that people who are in that area especially take a look at it. And I'm gonna, Mike has, has agreed to talk to me today to give me a little bit more information. And um, if, if I need to, I will share whatever I want. Thank you very much. Okay, and that's it. Okay, we're moving on to item number seven, introduction of new CTAC members. We have three people here today, but one of them has not yet been voted on by the HRTPO and PDC, which is required. So I will welcome Brad Martin from Virginia Beach, who is over there. Um, and we will formally introduce you next time around, okay? Thank you. Uh, meanwhile, we have two other members, uh, George Mears from Suffolk, over there. It's nice to see you. Um, there is something written here, but I always ask people to say a little bit more about themselves because you know more about you than anybody else. That's all. Okay, my name is George Mears. I'm now retired. I worked for 46 years, part of the time for uh, like for 
or something. Uh, I was, uh, I've got a BS in geology, an MBA in management, and a master's in environmental engineering. I spent for 23 years in the Navy as a pilot, commanding officer, air boss on the Enterprise. Uh, pertinent possibly to this is uh, I spent three years work, uh, applying for the Naval Oceanographic Office, uh, eddy currents, ocean analysis, uh, ice reconnaissance, polar magnetic studies, uh, and hurricane penetration tracking. And we turn, in fact, we, we trained the NOAA crews to take over the mission from the Navy. Uh, when I got out, I decided not to go for the airlines. I forgot the environmental engineering. I got picked up by URS Griner. I went during my master's, I worked for the city of Chesapeake Public Utilities. Uh, and I, my grant, I, I, I found my master's project there, groundwater modeling for the Bowers Hill area. It turned out uh, my, my master's ended up with the siting of the wastewater or the new water treatment plant near the airport. So it went to good use. So I know numerical modeling to some extent. Uh, then URS, I was with them until 2000. Uh, I was kind of recruited by the, by the Corps, our U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and I spent 17 years there. Uh, I was the design manager and the project manager and the construction manager for the four and a half mile NASA Wallops uh, beach uh, that held up very nicely during Sandy, otherwise they would have wiped out. Uh, uh, did a lot of some groundwater work, uh, super fun work, uh, FUD sites, forming descent defense cleanups, which I started with the grinder and uh, ended up doing the same thing in the core for a while. Then I got picked up in the project management. My last project was probably the uh, Catherine uh, Johnson uh, computational research facility with a 40,000 foot computer lab over at uh, Langley. Uh, my primary uh, clients were NOAA and NASA. That's it. So I did 23 years as, as an engineer, geologist, and 23 years as a as a pilot. Thank you. You've been busy. Trying to keep you busy here too. Thank you very much, Mark. If you would like to say a few words about yourself, because I know you've been busy too. Mm -hmm. Mark is a neighbor and friend of mine from the guy. So. Good afternoon. I came to Hampton Roads 47 years ago, courtesy of the United States Navy. I was assigned to a guided missile cruiser. I was home port in Norfolk. Um, I graduated in 1972, uh, joined Virginia, what was then Virginia National Bank as a computer operator trainee and uh, progress through computer operations man management to programming to analysis and after 23 years uh, they moved my job to Texas and uh, I decided that it, it should go on without me. <laughs> I became a an IT consultant for several years and had, a, had one of the better places shot out from under me as the result of the tech wreck of 2000-2001. I went back to school to get certified to teach that job didn't get shot out from under me. I, I just uh, got enveloped in deeper water that I was ready to, to handle. And so I rattled around for a little while. I worked in the U.S. Census Bureau in 2010. Very interesting work, and I hope that there'll be another opportunity for me this coming year. But mostly I have been a civic activist. Uh, 24 years as a resident of Norfolk, 23 in the county of Portsmouth. I attend many of the regional meetings and uh, 
word God in my city, God's the one I see it. So I hope to be able to contribute uh, the information that I have acquired over these 47 years to conversation. Thank you very much. So we have two new people who have a lot to bring to the table here, and I welcome both of you. And Brad, you now have your homework assignment. You know you're going to have to do this next time. <laughs> Come prepared, please. I know we've approved the agenda, but the times, the times that are listed on the agenda are a little bit off. <laughs> yeah, we're moving right along. But that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, that, that's why, you know, I'm not like pushing anybody through here. Um, we're, we're doing very well time-wise. I talk fast. That yeah, let's talk about the, it's like a tight little Thank you. you oh, okay, I see what you mean. Okay. Um, we now have our presentation. Well, good afternoon, uh, CTAC members, Madam Chair. Um, I'm really excited to really introduce this item to you and then step aside and invite our guest speaker to come up and walk you through uh, this project. It's a project that I think is a really exciting discussion point for the CTAC. This is a tremendous opportunity for you all to become involved. Um, if, if, if we're on a journey of steps one through ten in this process, we're about 1.5 right now, so it's incredibly early on. This is a chance for you to give your perspectives on, on the regional planning initiative. And before I have John Martin come up, just a few things I'd like to throw out there for you to think about. You know, so when I, um, I'll be in Hampton Roads four years on July 1, and I've been thinking back a lot over that time. And a lot of my memories, it goes back to my interview where a panel of about 11 elected leaders asked me, Bob, do you think Camp the Rose needs a new brand? And I maybe thought I knew the answer to that question then, but um, you all and others have taught me a lot in the first four years. And as I look at Hampton Roads, I'm just incredibly excited about the things that are going on. And so many of them you've been engaged in. Um, but if we pause and think what we're doing as a metropolitan region today, $5 billion of transportation investment on the interstate highway network. 17 localities coming together to prioritize that and move those projects forward. That's the largest transportation construction program of any metropolitan region in the country. Something we can be proud of. Um, Subsea transatlantic cables that have landed on the shore of the beach of Virginia Beach in a regionally interconnected plan to spread that fiber around our region to support all of us and create economic opportunity. What an incredible, incredible opportunity. One of the most powerful ports on the East Coast in dredging of our port channel and, and a facility that really supports the East Coast economy. Our new CTAC member probably knows all about the HRSD Swift Water Reuse Program that um, some claim is a national model for taking wastewater and treating it to drinking water standards, injecting it into the ground, and now you protect the bay and you also slow land subsidence and saltwater intrusion. Just a lot of exciting things happening. Um, we recently reconfigured our Economic Development Alliance, Coretta, as a true re regional economic development alliance. So we're going to start to market and promote our region collectively as one region. So a lot happening regionally that really creates a lot of excitement for us. But one of the areas where it seems that we need to improve is how we tell our story. And that's what this branding initiative is about. How do we tell our story? What are we proud of? How are we wired as a community in terms of the things we're passionate about? What, do we, what is Hampton Roads to us? What do we want Hampton Roads to become? That part of it we haven't quite got to yet. And that's what John's about to talk with you about. So, um, really excited. John Martin is, is your speaker today. He's with SIR. Had the pleasure to work with John for seven years. I know John for 11 years now um, as a professional colleague and as a friend. So I couldn't be more excited that it's his firm that's been selected to lead this effort. Uh, the funding for this effort was raised by a private sector group called Reinvent Hampton Roads. 
Uh, now that the funding's been secured, this effort has now been turned over to the community. And John's going to describe for you the process that we're going to uh, go forward. So John, um, I'm going to step aside, let you come on up up here. Um, I'm going to do some handouts, circulate while John's talking. And um, we'll let, let John carry you through this process. Thank you for having me. I have a, a wonderful story to share with you about this, what we're calling Vision 2020. And I understand we have an early afternoon together. So I'm going to take my time and uh, really allow for you guys to ask questions. And then when we get towards the, the second half of it, really to provide input into our process. So this is going to be very helpful, I hope, for you in learning how we're going to allow this. It's going to be helpful for us to get info for you guys, from your perspective. So, John, this yes. sort of sucks up the noise a bit. It might be helpful to go with the mic. I apologize. That's no problem. That, that I'll, I'll stand behind the podium. It's <laughs> something I rarely do. <laughs> so, uh, Bob, thank you for that nice introduction. My um, firm's a 55-year-old company headquartered in Richmond. I get the wonderful benefit of living in both Richmond and Hampton Roads. So I'm back and forth all the time. But we get to work with a lot of big private sector companies as well as uh, public sector entities. We just finished doing the Virginia Beach City Council retreat for a couple of days. That was great. Uh, worked, done a lot of work for Norfolk and Centera and um, support beat out a lot of things in this market. So we really have a, a great sense of kind of what goes on here and the ethos of this market. So it was a real honor to be tapped in to do this. I'm going to start by way of two headlines that I want you to keep in mind. Uh, when you think about coming up with a new name for Hampton Roads, you know, that's not the silver bullet. It's not like, oh God, if we just had a name, everything would be great. No, the silver bullet is actually the silver bullets that Bob was just talking about. It's all the things that you guys are doing. It's the $5 billion in transportation improvements. It's it's the uh, improvement of the ports. It's creating this great place and all the work it takes to do that. And, and really, a lot of that great work goes on right here in this room, which is, is really kind of cool. The second headline I want you to keep in mind as I take you through this is that there's actually a thoughtful <coughs> sense of the process that, that regions and cities go through in figuring out naming architecture and marketing. And, and so that's the discipline that we're bringing to this. So when you hear people say, oh, should it be Coastal Virginia or Tidewater, let's vote. That is not what we have in mind. That is not the process. Uh, it's not that simple. And I hope by uh, way of this presentation, you'll realize that a lot more thought is going into this um, plan, if you will, communications plan. So what I want to take you through is why this initiative is important. Uh, best practices and what we would call place marketing. So that's sort of kind of a new term, but place marketing. Uh, and then our process for Hampton Roads, and you've got a handout on this, but I want to take you through um, our discipline and how we're going through this eight-month process. And then we'll get to your input in terms of um, some of the things you'll help us in crafting our research design. So, I hope I came to the right meeting. Okay. Well, why this is important, why this initiative is important. Now, this is the home of data right here, the, the Planning District Commission and the TPO. And if you look at a lot of the demographic data, and you look at it over time, it doesn't tell a wonderful story about Hampton Roads. The population in Hampton Roads has not been growing as fast as we wanted, especially when you compare it to like Richmond, growing at 10% over the last seven or eight years, and then look at the state of Virginia growing at 5%. And we can, we, we're very fortunate as a company to work for a, a lot of different regions and cities. And, and boy, I, I tell you, my barometer of growth are construction cranes. And when you go to Nashville and you go to Charlotte and you just see the whole skyline lined up with construction cranes, you go, something's going on here. And, uh, and we do have a few here, but these numbers really kind of tell the story that, that we, we're not having dramatic growth when you think about the Hampton Roads market. And in fact, if you look at in-migration and out-migration, you come up with a net migration number, and you look at it just for the 2016-2017 period, you get a sense of where we are compared to other cities. And so a couple of those that I just referenced, like 
um, Charlotte and Nashville and Orlando, you can see that they are bringing in many more people that are leaving. And we're at the other end of the continuum with sort of a negative net migration number. So not good, not good. We need to reverse that. And, and, it, and, it, and it really, there are a lot of culprits, but boy, there is a really good correlation to the number of people and the growth of people and the growth of jobs. And I'm going to explain why in just a minute, but if you look at the military employment in Hampton Roads, it's, it isn't going in the right direction over time. And the same thing about the output from the private sector in terms of the, you're going to call it the local domestic product or GDP. Uh, the growth of sort of the value of goods and services coming out of a region. You can see Raleigh is really leading the way with Richmond uh, right behind it, but then Hampton Roads is sort of flat in terms of that growth. So every way you look at this, we've got to get more traction here and more momentum. And it's going to be hard because there are these headwinds that every region has to face. And uh, many of them are demographic. And some are really, really entrenched headwinds that um, have been conspiring for really a, a couple of decades. One is the mover rate. We're not moving around as much as Americans. You know? we're, we're just not. So we're at 11% as a mover rate. Uh, and the guys that, that, that move, when you look at the makeup, it's really the young group. They're the people that are just out of college into age 35, that's about 40% of all the moves that happen. So you really want to you really want to have those young people here when they decide to stop moving and pull down the average, but you really want them to have experienced your market so you can, you can grow when, they, when it's time to settle down and, and make, uh, have children. So it's this young group that's age 18 to 34 that's 40% of the movers, and if you take into account these people that have to sort of follow their parents around uh, and take them out, age 0 to 17, then, then this group 18 to 34 is really half the market. And so people say, well, I'm so tired of hearing about millennials. Well, it's millennials today, it's Gen Zs in the future, it's young people. And you've got to be winning that battle for young people. But two things are conspiring to make the battle even more important. And the first one is their life expectancy. Because of folks like Sentara and EBMS and, and uh, Bon Secours and others, you know, medical research is helping us live longer exponentially longer. If you go over the last hundred years, you can see we've added many, many years to our lives. And so the average age now is getting up to you know, 78, 80 years old is life expectancy. You know, if you go back a hundred years, it was like 45. So, so we really have seen a dramatic improvement there. We've also seen something that is really quite interesting over time and over generations. It's the shifting birth rate. After World War II, when uh, silent generation started really saying, okay, we're past, this, we're past this moment in time, this horrific worldwide war, people started having a lot of babies. There was a baby boom. I am the result of it. I'm looking around the room. Many of you guys are baby <laughs> boomers. Well, the birth rate went to four kids per woman of the birthing years. Four kids was the birth rate, 4.1. It then started falling off. It started falling off for a lot of different reasons, one of them the birth control. But now if you look at the production rate, the birth rate, it's down to two, 2.1, two. So that's the replacement rate. So the growth, actually, of America is the story of immigration, legal immigration. So don't lose that in the, this debate. But when you think about it, think about how many brothers and sisters you have, you fellow boomers out there, right? And the answer is usually three, because there were four of you. Now, if you look today at young families, they're having two kids. So if you factor these two things into play, we're living longer, and we have the shifting birth rate that now is half of what it was with the baby boomers, you are fundamentally changing the population pyramid. Ever since the dawn of time, we've had more younger people alive than older people. It's in all the sociology textbooks. And this is actually a worldwide thing. Always more younger people, people die off, fewer older people. But because of those two transcendent trends, the longevity revolution and the shifting birth rate, they are conspiring to change the population pyramid. And so here's the way it looks in most of our college textbooks. Men on the left, women on the right, how many people alive at each age band, 
and hence a population pyramid. And the darker colors here are the baby boomers because we're looking at 1960. Now, I won't take you through every year, but I'm just going to flash forward to 2030. And look at this shape. It's fundamentally shifting shape. So look at my elbows. When I go from a population pyramid to a rectangle, my elbows are coming in a little bit. So if you look at this population pyramid going to a rectangle, we're not having all these people right here, the younger people. Wow. So this is causing a lot of head scratching and a lot of planning and some intentional action, not only in the US, but around the world. If you look at this chart for Japan, for instance, it's really cute. So what it means for us, though, is in the future, there are relatively fewer younger people and relatively more older people. And it's just a fact. It's a demographic fact. So the battle's going to be on for younger workers to have their, a fair share of younger workers for, for not only a location, but for, for big companies. And so this is fundamentally changing our economic development model. I want to show you some numbers that we have um, looked at from the Bureau of Labor uh, Statistics. And we looked at the last decade in the 25 to 54 year old sweet spot of the workforce, 150, 149 million workers. And then 19, uh, 2016, 159, so six, 10 million more workers. But look at the growth. It isn't in this sweet spot. And it's not the younger group, it's really been the older 55 plus growth in the workforce over the last 10 years because of this population pyramid. Now let's go out into the future and go out and, and look at 2026. And you see this, the 25 to 54 isn't really growing, it's, it's sort of flat. In fact, the growth is in the 55 plus. Us boomers in the room, we're going to be in demand, right? <laughs> and then you look over here at the young workforce, it's actually in decline. So these numbers aren't just theory, you know? This is a real, real issue that's going on. And it's causing some consternation in boardrooms and in planning rooms like this. What do we do? Exacerbating this is this unbelievable unemployment rate. 3.6% is a 49-year low. And so companies, you talk to the HR departments and they'll tell you the biggest thing is like, I need talent. I need to recruit and retain talent to keep growing. It's, it's, it's slowing us down, not having enough talent. Well, the population of America is projected to grow, but the workforce, the working age population, isn't going to grow as much, only by half as much. So a lot of experts, barring some horrific recession, are saying we're going to have a big shortage of labor over the next 10 years in particular. We're going to have a big shortage, and it's going to cause us to get even more anxious, and I think for the smart winning communities, more competitive. And, and, uh, and to up our game, because this battle is going to be on for younger workers. Now, we do a lot of great studies for, for companies and cities and such, and I just want to be clear. Everything you've just seen, this is not SIR making this up. This has been going on long enough for people to write books about it. But it's only now getting into the mainstream, and people are going, oh, what are we going to do? And that's why it's an exciting time to be here in Hampton Roads, because we know companies are preparing for this future. When you talk to the people that move companies, they say, I'm chasing talent. When we do research among site selection um, consultants, and there are a whole slew of them that represent companies and sort of pitch cities against each other to say who's going to win this, this prize, we talk to the site selection consultants, and they say that the decision today starts and ends with do they have the people we need? And they really will say, say, what are you looking for in a location? They go, talent, talent, talent. Now, they're also looking for a great mobility system and transportation and others, but it's talent that's leading the way. And they want to know that 85% of the talent is there, and they're not going to move and then have to struggle to, to fill those jobs that they're creating. They also want to know that the jurisdiction has plans in place and is thoughtfully thinking about what's that future talent pipeline? Are we working with all the universities to get them to keep their seniors here and figure out, the, line up jobs for those people that are graduating and make sure everybody is working to understand the future talent pipeline? So talent, talent, talent. Now, we see two models happening that cities are using in this talent war. The first one is to buy residents. Then that's the right verb. B-U-Y, or to actually purchase residents. The second one is building a great place, but let me take you through this first one. 
Tulsa. It's not a bad place, right? Tulsa, Oklahoma. Boy, they're looking at demographic data just like I shared with you, and they're saying, oh my gosh, we've got to get more workers here, especially more younger people. So they're running ads. Hey, remote workers, we'll pay you to work from Tulsa. You're going to love it here. $10,000 cash if you move to Tulsa. Because what they're thinking is you might come here as a teleworker and work for somebody somewhere else, but you're going to spend your money here. Your paycheck will get spent while you're living here. And you just might happen to have a partner who's going to come and get a job. So, and Tulsa's not alone. Baltimore said, come here and take a tour. And by the way, if you buy a house here, we're going to give you $5,000 to put down on that house. That's kind of modest compared to, well, St. Clair County, Michigan, $15,000 to move here. Unbelievable. And then I'm... No disrespect to anybody that might be from here, but where is there? Harmony? I mean, Harmony, Minnesota is saying we'll pay you $12,000 to come here. Vermont, $10,000. And if you go to Vermont, you realize that demography has created kind of the sea of sameness up there. It's a half a million people, just north of half a million people. It's mostly older white people. Just, just a fact. Now, Maine is the same way. Maine is saying, hey, come here. We really want the younger people that have student loans. And we'll pay off your student loans if you come here. So now all these young people in the room are starting to get their phones out. <laughs> so I, I'm not really a fan of all of this. I think it's a dangerous, slippery slope when you start doing this. Model 2, I think, is the more sane approach, which is build and promote a great place. And then people will want to meet them. And then these employers will say, that's where the talent is. I'm going there. I'm going there. So the old economic development model, and I have been in it all my life. When I started off, I worked with Fairfax County economic development effort, the state of Virginia, Richmond. I've just seen the model evolve over time, and it used to be you go after those big Fortune 500 companies, those corporate whales, you try to get them to come, people will follow, and then you get enough resources and your community kind of grows. Right? The new model is recognizing this talent, talent, talent attraction, so you recruit targeted industries that do well, you're a little more sophisticated on going after industries that do well and have proven themselves in your area, but you build a sense of place and community that people want to flock to and be in, and then businesses are going to be attracted by that available talent. And you're going to find that that talent has this alchemy, once it's, once it's there, that, that it, the great things happen with it, that startups happen and, and entrepreneurs uh, get excited about it. So it's not only attracting new targeted companies, but it's also growing from within. So this new model is the model that I think smart regions are starting to uh, employ and really try to figure this out because the winning cities of tomorrow are going to attract the best workforce and in order to do that you've got to be an attractive place one of the most attractive places and you've got to be able to promote that so we have developed a model over the years and all the research we've done for regions and cities and, and we have a, a handout that you have which really brings it to life it's the ten traits that will define winning regions of tomorrow and this is the world according to my firm, SIR, okay? So I get to be king for a minute with this model. But what we have seen is, is that you've got to think about your future based on who's going to be in the future. And that means millennials and Gen Zs. And I want to make one quick point about millennials. Millennials, in 2025, it's not very far from here, right? That's like six years. 2025. Millennials are going to be 46% of the workforce. But they're not going to be young people. They're going to have aged, right? And then you got Gen Zs coming in. So I say with that statistic, 46%, millennials are going to win. They're going to get their way. They're going to be in charge. So all their values about we, us, together, how we do things, are going to influence what a future place needs to be like or what it will be like. So we do a lot of research on understanding generations, a ton of research. We presented some of that in this room over the years. But understanding millennials and Gen Zs and how they're wired is really important. Um, so we have a couple of sidebars on each one, which really influence the way we see the world. 
And what we think of these 10 traits, you've got to have a shared story and fuel word of mouth positive buzz. And that's what we call place marketing. But these other eight variables or tenets are really about place making and building a great place. And I'm thrilled that you guys invited us to be here because I know your charge, your Magna Carta is about transportation and mobility. That is one of these traits, one of these 10 traits. You've got to be hyper-connected. You've got to have mobility. You've got to, you know, we just finished a strategic plan for DMV. Because DMV is gone, DMV Virginia. Holy cow, we're not selling as many driver's license. These young people aren't getting driver's license. Right? I tried to give my son a car for graduating on budget on time. Yes. He said, no, thank you. Yes. I said, I paid for it. Yes. <laughs> no, thank you. I'm going to do the insurance, too. Yes. You did great. You saved me so much money. You got it in four years from VCU. Deal of a lifetime. Yes. Could I just get a camera, Dad? Yes. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> you are so smart. You've got a camera. <laughs> you know, and it was one until his girlfriend said, would you please get a car so I can marry you and feel like you're responsible? <laughs> it, it, it made the difference. And he said, Dad, should I get a car now? And I went, well, the deal's off. You've got a job now. <laughs> and I said, secondly, yes, I love that girl. Marry her. Get a car. So anyway, so DMV is going to become more of the documents agency and record-keeping agency of the future, which is just fascinating. But I want you to think about that in terms of this hyper-connectivity and building a great place. And I think that $5 billion going into roads. And I love that. I'm not against roads. I've got a car and I'm driving all over the place. But understanding how else to get people to move around, whether that's scooters, whether it's Uber, and, and I had a whole other presentation about the future of mobility with um, autonomous vehicles and what that's going to mean. So, so anyway, thinking through that and thinking about building place, it's important that you guys have a seat at the table and thinking about how do we market this place and what's important. So I applaud you for that, that sort of foresight. So I want you to think about this because in all of these variables, if you're intentional, you can make things happen faster. But that's what you guys have done. A lot of you volunteering and, and being on boards is part of, the, uh, a part of your ethos. But in some sense of the way, you are, you are driving these and making them happen faster than they would happen normally. So today, though, I want to talk more about place marketing, but these other variables are important, these other place-making variables. But in place marketing, it's about a shared story and having a positive buzz. So I'm going to take you through the best practices of place marketing and show you how it's being done in other regions before I get into the process that we're using to discern what should our region's marketing strategy be. So I'm going to stop there, take a sip of water, and see if you have any questions so far. Yes, sir. I'm surprised not to see. First of all, great, great, great presentation. I, I, so far, I, I love it. Okay. Uh, but uh, um, I'm, a little, I'm a little dis disappointed in that I don't see the equity here among the ten traits. Well, it is. Is, is, it, is it embedded somewhere? Let me talk to that. Okay. It says big tent. See that big tent one? Yeah. That is the most important one of all of them. You have to be a big tent. You have to be a region, a city, a region, where everybody feels like they belong, where everybody is treated equal, where everybody can be what they want to be. When we do studies on who moves in America and who has moved over 100 miles and who plans to move, one of the real big motivators of moving is A, feeling like I'm going after a job that's there. B, there's family there. It's about a third, a third, a third. The other third is I want to be in that location because it makes me feel like I belong. It makes me feel like I'm important. So what we think, and I should come and one day do this entire trade presentation to you, especially the transportation one, the mobility one, but, but what we see is people saying, you know, I want to maintain my own identity now. That we used to be a melting pot as a society. But now we've shifted to a bento box. That what we are is we have our own individual traits and personalities. We don't want to give that up. I want to be known for this. I want to have, I'm not picking anybody, purple hair and these beliefs. And I want to be respected for that. I still want to look over the edge of my little corner of the world, of the box, and I still want to be part of the larger box. 
but it's okay and celebrate me like this. And so people have this sense of belonging, that's what they want. They want to find places that's a big tent that says, come here, everybody's welcome here. Everybody's part of the story of Hampton Roads, Virginia Beach. And so we call that the big tent. And if you recognize that this particular diversity, inclusion, and equity is so important, the cities that get that down, then they're using that as the strategy to accomplish much more with all the other ones. It becomes a differentiator. Now here's the great news. All the work we've done for Norfolk, and a little bit of work we've done for the region, diversity is one of those words when we say, what words define Hampton Roads or define Norfolk? And diversity in a wordle is one of the most often mentioned words. But have we figured out how to tap into that is the question. But I think it's part of the answer when we get to the answer. So great question. Big tent. We gotta be a big tent city, big tent region. Yes, sir. Uh, so I think that this region in the Mid Atlantic and Southeast is one of the premier places to live near the ocean and in the metropolitan area. One of your slides, you talked about um, having, you know, doing things that invite companies to want to be here, yep. and that gets people here, but then people come because companies are here, so it's like a vicious cycle. Uh, are you going to speak to? best practices that you've seen to help make that happen, because I think that's something that we're challenged with here. In, in terms of telling our story? Well, well you, you want to have the get. people, yeah. and then the companies are going to know where the people are, but to get the people, sometimes you need the oh. business, so that's right. that balance, balance that out. That's right. And it is a little bit of a chicken and egg, but what we're seeing more and more is that people are picking place. And so a third of the people that move pick place. And we want to definitely be on their list. We want them to come here. The other advantage that we have here that hardly any other jurisdiction has is our wonderful military. And the fact that so many young people get out of the military <laughs> after a service and they get decommissioned or whatever the right verb is right here. And they know Norfolk. It's been in their past. And so how can we get more of them to say, I want to stay here? I think Norfolk. The Hampton Roads was just on a top list of places to retire for the military. <coughs> veterans, the top place for veterans to retire, which is fantastic. Yes, sir. If I may, I've got uh, two millennials. One of them's out in Oklahoma City, making about 400 grand a year, oil and gas. The other one works uh, down in Louisiana. Right. Chemical engineer, also oil and gas, works for Slumberjay. Yep. And manages a couple of group hubs. They, but the jobs weren't here, and, and there's a there's a lot of issues. I've jotted down some notes, if you and, and they feed into a lot of what you're saying. Yeah, there's like ten education. The, yep. the reputation here is negative. Yep. You know, my son went to MIT. Uh, when he graduated, they wanted him to take the nuclear design job in D.C. The four-star uh, new new admiral said, "How the hell did someone from Suffolk end up at MIT?" He said, my parents believe in education, and so do I. We sent them to private school. Yeah. You know, paid, it was an ROTC scholarship, went there, so, got a new, so he's, he's got two masters. There's no jobs for him here. Yeah. Uh, okay. The other one, uh, UVA, uh, biology and chemistry. Uh, he married the head cheerleader there, so he stayed for a, a master's in organic chemistry. Then he went down to Tulane and got his chemical engineering. There's no jobs for him here. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's part of the issue. The colleges are few and small. Yeah. They're not putting out, you know, STEM talent kind of people. So the, you know, the, the talent pool is not here to bring in the big jobs. Uh, good college grads, there's no jobs for them. And they're lo uh, low paying and long hours, like Conrad Hill. And I don't care, I don't ask people to work half a day. I don't care if it's the first 12 hours or the second. Mm -hmm. uh, millennial, the millennial exodus, I'm seeing it yeah. all over the place. <laughs> Class environment, very positive. We we have to be able to market that because you know limited space to bring in industry, gentrification, and affordable uh, housing, very negative. Yep. Energy policies at the state level, very negative. You know they're anti pipeline, they're anti gas, they're anti oil. They're growth my kids uh, <laughs> offshore drilling. They're pushing unreliable power. Uh, just an aside, when you put in a sewer pipeline. Like on the eastern shore, they don't want it because you look at Maryland, you look at uh, you know the northern states. As soon as you get a sewer pipeline, 
the, the housing clusters pop up like mushrooms. Sure. But with a with oil and gas pipelines, natural gas particularly, you've got industries coming in because they've got plentiful, reliable, affordable, you know, uh, reliable power, yep. and everyone's fighting. Yep. And we've got two thirds of the state. I mean, that, that needs to come down here, and you'll set, you'll start having industries popping up along where the power is available. Uh, private sector startups, if there are hardly any uh, municipal budget increases, populations going down. The initial bu budgets are, are blowing up. So there's a whole bunch of things here that says, why do I want to move there? Now you look at the traffic jams, that's a negative two. That's right. So I mean, the kids don't, you know, they want to have a balanced life. Yep. They, they, Oklahoma City, they've got whole parcels of land. I mean, you don't have to pay a darn thing. You go up there and you have, you've got kid parks with water, uh, water games and all this sort of stuff. And they're completely free. And the, the, the mothers and the dads are out there with their kids all the time. That's right. We don't, we don't offer that. Suffolk doesn't even have a public pool anywhere in the city. Well, it's, it's leaders like you that need to reverse this, that need to point this out, that need to say there are areas that we need to work on. We need to work on all 10 of these areas. I'm going to talk to you about how we're going to work That's on That's why I want to feed it in because I think you're touching on a lot of them right here. Yeah, I mean, there's just no question. This, we've done 15,000 studies, many for cities, and, and, and we know what actually <coughs> people want. In fact, a byproduct of what I'm going to take you through is we are going to engage young professionals in this process. I'm going to share with you how we're doing that. But through the research that we're going to do, we're going to give them data and the ability to package a plan together that they're going to present to the establishment of Hampton Roads about what they're looking for in the community. It'll be so much stronger than me standing up saying, this is what we've got to do to keep young people. We're going to hear it from the young people. And that's what we did in Richmond that was transformative to make Richmond a hotter place. We had a group of young people empowered to do a bunch of research, and we said, you guys do it. We'll be the coach, but you're presenting it. And it became the hottest presentation in town to all the different groups, Bob remembers this, and, and it really got everybody focused on, oh my gosh, we, we have to turn the other way and let them paint these murals we don't understand. Oh my gosh, we have to invest in, in um, a culinary school. And oh my gosh, we have to start putting our corporate money into food festivals. I get it now, when the young people stood in front of corporate Richmond and said, it isn't about the dopey food trucks, it's about community. Food equals community. That's what we're about. We, us, together. And the CEOs that looked like me all went, oh, okay. Maybe we should be doing that. City, can they do murals? They have to come down on Monday. But maybe we could just like, not go back to that site on Monday. And, just, you know? and so all of this stuff was intentional that really helps speed things along. And that's what we have to do. Because we really have to be working, again, SIR's model, we're probably missing a couple of circles, but this is what we see. But I tell you, it's ex and it's an exciting time, and we just gotta make sure that um, we're there to support this region to be a great place. And we need to help facilitate the sharing of our story on what we do have, and that's where I wanna go. So I'll answer a couple more questions, and we'll get to the next section. But I love this interaction. It's great. Mark and then Brad. Uh, yes, one of your uh, points was that we are going to face a challenge in attracting enough people to fill all the jobs in this area in the future. Um, but how does that factor? I've heard presentations where so-called experts are predicting that in the next 20, 30 years, <clears throat> we're going to lose millions of jobs as a country because of technology and artificial intelligence, particularly anyone who drives a truck or a train or something like that. So how does that counter trend fit in with your yeah. with your overall approach? No, and that, that's a great question. And the, the word is disintermediation. And so you talk to a lot of the experts, McKinsey and Bain and Company and think tanks in Europe, and they say about a third of the jobs in the next uh, 10 to 20 years are going to be displaced, right? I don't think so. And again, this is my company's theory right? in studying this. I think what's going to happen is that we are going to shift jobs and that we're going to need to have more people in the workforce, but it's going to be a different kind of work. It's not like the internet 
disintermediated all these jobs. It just shifted all of us to more technology jobs. So, so there's not these travel agents around because we're all doing our own scheduling. But still, we're, we're in a situation where we have a job employee shortage. So I just think that we're going to find out that workforce training now is predominantly for the least skilled, least educated folks. That what we see is that communities in the future are going to scale workforce training to, to help people that have college degrees but shift them to new sort of lines of work. We're seeing this in Charlotte right now. We do a ton of work in Charlotte. Remember Marcus Jones? That he was the mayor and then the city manager. So he, he brought us, we were helping him in Northland. He took us to Charlotte. One of the things we're seeing in Charlotte, they, they're killing it in terms of economic development. They have more companies lined up and they can almost show them tours in Charlotte. It's just phenomenal. And they're becoming known as a tech center. They have the fastest growing tech workforce uh, in the country. It's just shocking how many technology workers that are in demand there. And what is happening is that company, it's like a fintech capital of, the, of America. Outside of New York, it's got more people in financial services than in the other city. So what's happening there is that companies, because they can't get enough workers, even though 100 people a day move there, companies are retraining their workforce to teach people that don't know coding to learn coding and putting them through the local community college training programs. And so they're creating tech workers out of their loyal workers. They're not just displacing them. And so I think that we're going to see that on a larger scale. I don't know, but that's kind of what we're seeing. But that's a great question. It's a great question. There was another one. You know. Thanks so much for being here. And you and Gary talked about diversity. And I've been here all my life. And I think that is one of the best characteristics of our region. And I'm not just talking about our skin color. I'm talking about the diversity of our age generations. I'm talking about you can live on a farm out in Suffolk, or you can live in a condo in Norfolk, yep. or whatever. And I'm sure I'm telling you something you already know, and I'm sitting in a regional conference room, so I'm, I'm getting around to this regional idea, but it's all my first time, so I'll get you to my next meeting. But I think the inherent challenge we have is you've got these 17 cities yes. that have historically had trouble working together. Yes. And whether we're fighting over the entrance at the outlet mall, or whether we're renaming the Tidewater Tides to the Norfolk Tides, or whether we're not wanting to collaborate on a professional team because the arena is not going to be yeah. where I think it should be. What are the challenges? And then you have the real successes. You, you yeah. touched on the transportation um, solution that we've got. That is a huge, huge. regional success to get from here to Williamsburg and beyond. And I think we can see what, what that collaboration is meaning to our individual citizens in our individual cities. And we've got a real regional challenge here to deal with sea level rise. That's right. Is it going to take notching some of those successes as a region? And, and how, how quickly can that take well, root and really turn us into a region? So, um, no, no disrespect, and, and I'm not saying we're not a region yet. I apologize. Well, let me, let me tell you, it's a, it's a journey, and it has a lot to do with momentum. Yeah. Okay? And I have been working in this market my my whole career, I've had a lot of clients here. And it's, it's only now that I'm starting to think, you know what, this is the little engine that could. We've reached this tipping point. But it's only now facilitating the um, Virginia Beach retreat for, for two and a half days and having them talk about what we can do to support the region and talk about maybe we do need to have a shared coliseum, you know, and maybe it's not in, in Virginia Beach, it's somewhere else. But, but, but to have these conversations happen, and then to say, you guys taxed yourself and you got $5 billion already dedicated. No other region has that. And then we get this fiber optic cables coming ashore, two of them, two more planned, building down. And then for Virginia Beach to say, we're not just going to keep this for ourselves. We're going to get a fiber network ring here. All this is so exciting. And then to have the region come together and say, let's figure out this branding thing. You know, that, that is what has to happen. And so you guys have turned the corner. But now what we need to do is we need to take this message and, and everybody be an apostle about it, an evangelist about it, and share. There's t there are like 10 stories that all of us should know by heart, like the $5 billion in transportation, the, the $700 million going to the port system, 
the fiber optic ring that Norcott. Bob knows he dreams about him, and he's, this is. <laughs> but but we need a sheet, a message sheet, and everybody needs to be saying this. And if people are saying no, 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 we should be the same. Let's just have these seventeen different hamlets and all just be quiet. That's death. That's death. That's what's going to happen. You're going to go the wrong direction because you've got all these other places that are just figuring out how to take it to the next level. And so if you're, and, and what I think, I'm a little passionate about this. What, <laughs> what I really think is going to happen, the millennials and the Gen Z's behind them, they don't see borders. They do not see borders. So in Charlotte, the millennials, they have six people on city council. They're up for election every two years, ridiculous. But they get voted in every two years, they run for election. This last election period, a year and a half ago, six millennials won. Brand new, never done office before. And so they come into city council on their first day, and it was really funny, because they was there, and they, they were saying, why are we filming this and like going live? And when and the older city council members who got reelected, the six of them that fortunately squeaked out, they said, well, we, we, we get the tape done, but then we put it in a week later because it's distracting. And then, so one of the young people said, well, let's just go Facebook Live right now. I've got my phone, and I'll just turn it on, so now we'll be live on the Internet. <laughs> right? They think differently. And so what they said was, well, we got elected because we want more affordable housing, one of those ten traits. And what they said, the older elected veterans said, well, yeah, well, we have, we had these riots, so we decided we're going to build 5,000 affordable housing units, and like the United Way thermometer, we're at 2,500, and so in another year and a half, we'll have the 5,000 new affordable housing units. We're feeling pretty good about this. And those six millennials said, no, that's not what we have in mind. we got something much bigger in mind. Well, what? Well, we went and... Uh, learned about this thing called a referendum, and we, we need to do a referendum and raise like $75 million to get the community to fund this. And the older people said, well, are you, are you think they're going to all vote for this? They said, yeah, they're going to vote for this, and we're going to get the private sector to give us just as much money. These are all millennials who've never been in office. One of them was appointed, but then she had to run for re-election. So sure enough, they had a referendum. And the city, it passed by like 80%, 70-something percent to, to, the, to the good. They raised all this public sector money. They went to Hugh McCall, who ran Bank of America, who was semi-retired, said, Hugh, we need you to come up and match this. He got together with the CEOs, Lending Tree and other companies, and damn if they didn't. So they had this big event in Charlotte. I was there, and he said, we just raised some $150 million for affordable housing. Then the mayor looked at the affordable housing builders and said, if you mess this up, we're going to the construction business. <laughs> <laughs> so they, are, they just redid the entire game for affordable housing. And, and they got lists coming in there now, and you know those guys. And, um, so, so what I'm saying is, I think that, that we have big problems, but we're going to have big solutions. And the millennials are all about we, us, together. And that's why in this presentation on these 10 <laughs> traits, we really think about where the millennials are, what do they want? Because I think they going to be part of the solution. We have to keep our millennials, and we've got to get more here. So let me tell you how we're going to do that. Let's go into this next section and talk about this branding effort, but just from the lens of other communities right now. And I know Hampton Roads is different in that we don't have this one center city, you know, like a Richmond or a Columbus, where we've got all the tall buildings right in the middle, and then we've got the classic suburbs, and so we have a baked-in kind of region. We're, we're spread out, and that's just something we got to deal with. We can't change that. So, when you think about, when you think about place marketing, it has two, two, two pillars. One is, you got to have a shared story, and then the other is, you got to be able to scale word of mouth using that shared story. Okay? So, the idea here is that regions, the winning regions of tomorrow, are going to intentionally curate their shared stories. It's not one tagline, I love New York, or what goes on in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. It's much more complicated than that. It's much more of a mosaic, but it's the right messaging. So in branding, what I do for a living in helping companies and, and cities, there's a different kind of branding strategies that you can employ. One is the idea of a house of brands, and in this case, this is Procter & Gamble. They have all of these brands. Many of you guys have these. Tide detergent or Crest toothpaste. What P&G says is every one of these brands is a brand by itself. And the consumer doesn't know that P&G owns all these. They don't care. 
is basically a house of different brands. Virgin Atlantic has a different kind of style, a different branding strategy. And this is Richard Branson's companies. And they're all called Virgin. And they all use that, that typeface that slants up to the right. But underneath that, all of his companies, Virgin Mobile, Virgin Megastore, Virgin Books, Virgin Wines, they all fit in nicely into what's called a branded house. And so what we believe is that the winning cities of tomorrow are going to morph towards the branded house look, not completely get there and say, no, every single entity, every single city, every single organization has to all be a cookie cutter, but morph towards where people are starting to share symbolism and messages. So it's a little more consistent in what's being said about the jurisdiction. And there's a process that you go through to figure this out. You do research, and then you figure out What's the positioning of that jurisdiction vis-a-vis -vis the competition? What makes us really unique? Diversity, water, military. How do we package that? Then how do we bring that to life, our message, our story? And then what are the implications for us in terms of our naming architecture, in terms of our logo, in terms of our symbols that we really try to use more than not? You don't start down here. You start over here. You try to figure it out first. And so that's the process that we're going through. But it's the process that other cities go through too to figure out a unified message and a unified image, if you will. So I'm just going to share some case studies to give you a sense of this. The good news is we don't have to figure all this out like as a science. We just have to follow the science. We just have to follow the process. So Columbus, Ohio. Columbus, Ohio is doing pretty well growing. They went through this process through a bunch of research and said, we got people and organizations that have weighed in on all these surveys and focus groups. And, and what we really feel like, what differentiates us is that we're really open and accepting of new ideas and new ways of thinking. And we have an incredibly highly educated workforce. And they do. If you look at the math behind it, they really do have a lot of preponderance of people with graduate degrees and such. So based on that, they came up with this positioning statement that they think differentiates them from other regions. And I just highlighted some of the words, but <clears throat> being open-minded approach to life and business, being a smart region, uh, you know, being open to all, always thinking forward, always be thinking big and open to new ideas. So based on all that, they said, we've got to have a look that says that we're open, that says that we're kind of a new forward-thinking we, us together community. And we've got to have a mark that people start to use and get excited about. So through all their research and this process they went through, they came up with a look I'm going to share with you in a minute that really brings that to life. But that's the story they arrived at. Fort Worth is another kind of effort, and we got to work on this one. And this is saying, okay, Fort Worth, what makes you unique and different? And I will tell you, every time we do this for a city, the people in the city think friendly differentiates them. It does not. <laughs> Every city is friendly. But in this case, the people in Fort Worth said, no, no, it's our stockyards, it's our Western culture. It's so we really probed on that to try to get to the kernel of truth, the, the true narrative of this place. And what they're talking about is this is a place where the West begins. Everybody here kind of has a little grit to them in a good way. That we're really, we get in here and just get it done. We're not always talking about it, we're doing it. And so it's the kind of, if you think about the true characteristics of a cowboy, and back then in those days it was really diverse, actually, in the West. But, but the idea of we are celebrating Western heritage here every day because it's, it's about who we are and getting it done. So with that, you come up with, in our term, we call this a placemat, and as we laminate them, they're 11 by 17, but you really kind of write, what is that message? Much like Fort Worth did. In this case, Fort Worth's a friendly and dynamic community. It's a place where everyone finds their inner cowboy spirit, a passion for diverse cultures, creativity, pioneering spirit, welcoming hand, and get it done now drive. Fort Worth's the only city where the West begins and the spirit never ends. Then the backside of it is organizing all the things that Fort Worth is doing and all the arts community and all the different nonprofits but under this idea, and so that's what you want to start thinking about. What is our narrative? And I'm going to get to the process that we're going to use to get to that. But you guys are already starting to share some of this. Diversity, the military, water, 
but how do we talk about it more than just as an attribute, but as a feeling that really differentiates us? And then how do we package it in unified imagery? Cincinnati is saying, and I'm going to show you a series of slides, all with the city municipal government, tourism effort, and then the chamber's effort. But there's Cincinnati saying, let's all use the C and start to use these colors. Not unifying our typeface, but certainly that kind of icon. In Denver, the groups are getting together and said, let's all use this three point three mountaintops kind of uh, imagery. Uh, in Phoenix, all the groups are saying, let's use the phoenix, the legendary bird that we're named after, right? Makes sense. Then in Richmond, we've come up with RVA, right? Have you all heard about this? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so RVA. Well, now the number one name in a business that gets started every single day is RVA. RVA cleaners, RVA dog groomers, RVA custom shop design builders, whatever. So it has really taken a hold there. And now the city government's embraced RVA. The tourism efforts, the RVA blog, it's RVA everything there, all the outfits you can buy, and hats. The economic development people have RVA. The chamber renamed its name RVA, Chamber RVA. And now people are tattooing RVA. <laughs> this is crazy. Columbus, I think, gets the prize. They've done a really great job. Um, so back to that branding strategy, that whole idea of being smart and open, they came up with this look. Now the stars over the US because it's the capital, but millennials, they're all about we, us, together, just like the Charlotte story. And so that's why accentuating that, it also says, by US, you know, we're right here, we're the gateway to the, to the world, Columbus. And this idea that we're, we're here for everybody, celebrating that diversity. So here's the city using it, Columbus, looks, looks official, kind of like the city. Here are the different departments within the city. <clears throat> but then here comes the Chamber of Commerce, slightly different type, but the idea of the Columbus with the US height accentuated still works. Same with tourism, but they say experience Columbus. Same with economic development, the Columbus region. But here's where it gets interesting. The Columbus Realtors, a nonprofit, says we want in on this too. We're going to do Columbus the same way. But just a dot, not a star, but nonetheless. And then the Community Foundation, right out of the strategy. We love our smart, open community. Right? Just bringing it to life. And here's the, the giveaway. They try to sell cards for people supporting nonprofits, the spirit of Columbus. I could go on and on, but let's go south to Jacksonville. So the airport code is JAX. Well, this is a standard sort of practice. If cities feel like people are using that, then they, they try to ride with it. And that's what they've done in Jacksonville. So they had a meeting where they said, you know, we've got to rebrand ourselves. We've got to become Northeast Florida and have Jack stand for something. And so the city's starting to use it. They just launched this new app that uh, you can use to get to city services called My Jacks. But then tourism using it, Jacks, it's easier here. <clears throat> So the chamber renamed itself Jack's Chamber, just like the Richmond RVA Chamber. Economic development, this is the regional partnerships, much like Hereta here. They call themselves Jack USA. And then they built this website, which I think should be part of our solution when we get to the ultimate implementation of all of this that we're doing here. You know, the economic development is trying to bring companies in. Tourism is trying to bring tourists in. Who's trying to bring residents in? What's it like to live in a place? What's the culture like? Well, that's what really smart cities are designing a whole answer to that. In some cities, like they actually even have millennials that you can actually talk to live. What's it like to live there? But it's all of a lifestyle site. It's all about what it's like to live and, and, and play. Well, um, what Brad was saying about the diversity of places to live here could be really highlighted in terms, you can live in an old town environment, you can live in a new town environment, right. you can live in a farm, on a farm. Right. You know, and I'll, I'll build on ocean. that in an yeah. awkward way. Yeah. And you can live here with LGBT communities here. You can live over here with the military community. You can live here, and you can live in a place where they all live together. We want everyone here. We're a big tent city. So this is a great site. Many cities do this. And you know the content comes from? People that live here. They kind of provide the content and share their story. And it's curated a little bit. You don't have an ugly story up there. But the idea is you show what your region really is like from the people that have decided to live there. And that helps in telling that shared story. But it goes beyond this. 
really smart regions that have packaged their story provide tools for their ambassadors, social media network people that just love to be out there posting stuff. But right now they're just posting anything they can find. But what if you gave them beautiful photography with images of people in it? Diverse people, people on the water, pictures of all of our homes that say we're Navy proud, which was incredible. The Navy's bringing more, more uh, planes here. The Air Force, they're, they're saying this community loves the military. So how do we show that on our website? But how do we have pictures? And if you talk to nonprofits, they'll say, oh, I wish I just had some really great photography that actually showed people, because you've got to get permission for them. Sometimes you need actors. But how do you create a whole photography bank that are digital resources? Or better yet, how do you create videos? Or, or how do you create narrative that people can cut and paste if they're an HR division of the shipyard and they're recruiting people? Are they using the right language to talk about this region? Is it all being organized? And when you really know you've got something, is when people tattoo RVA on their on their, <laughs> It's when people start using it across the community, and that's what they're doing in Jacksonville. The Jack's Driving School. That's nothing to do with the government. Jack's Brew Bus. Jack, I mean, so this is stuck. It's stuck in Columbus. It's stuck in Richmond. When you look at social media about Hampton Roads, there's a ton of different names that are being used. There's not one. In fact, uh, Freel uh, Williams, uh, when he uh, was talking about the success of the Somethings in the Water, yeah. he said, this isn't about Virginia Beach. This is about this entire region. 757, Coastal Virginia, it's whatever we want to call it. <laughs> right? yeah. So Charlotte is another thing that I know a lot about because we're working there. And that, that crown is owned by the city of Charlotte. And when Marcus got there, he said, yeah, that's our crown. And we said, you know, I don't know. I'm starting to see it being used by other people. And why don't we do a study and see if it really is the city's crown? Yeah, Marcus was right. 2% of the population think it represents the city government. <laughs> so with that, we said, give the crown up. Let the crown become the symbol for the region, not the municipal government. Right? Because this could be like the Target logo, the circles, the red dot. <laughs> Ten years from now, you see that, and you go, that's Charlotte. It's the Queen City. So in all of our research, we said, well, well what is the crown a symbol for? It's like... What, what is, of, of all the things that were out there, what is the symbol or image that stands to represent the Charlotte area? And that crown was the number one choice. The queen, because it's Queen City, was the second one, and then you see these others. But wow, that's like magic. When you say that, that half the population is saying, it's the crown, without us even trying, that's pretty good. And so we, we asked a lot of different ways of doing this. Your top choice for a unique, defining feature, characteristic, and Queen City came out, um, which was terrific. People call it the Queen City. So the idea is the symbology. Here's the new look for Charlotte. It's different colors to reinforce diversity, because they really believe this in a big way. And then that crown up there, and, and what we're saying is, OK, now we've got to have some narrative of what we're about. And so building on the values of Charlotte's is something that we wrote for them. But what we are saying is that you've got to start sharing this with everybody and the crown with everybody so you can make this happen faster. So here's the homepage of the Charlotte city government, right up front with the crown now. And then the city council retreat, we do city council retreats and we got an artist to come in and do a painting with the city council members. And we did it in the shape of a crown. So it was kind of unifying this whole experience. And then. Here's the tourism effort, explore the Queen City, and economic development, and all through the site you can read about the Queen City and, and see images of the crown. And now they're painting the crown on the water towers. So, so it's all now starting to get traction. And I think in the future, hopefully, when you just see the crown, you go, oh, that's sharp. <coughs> so they're having a symbol to unify them. And if you look around, you start to see other people are using crown. And so our point of view is, you know, sometimes you might be lucky and, and have a symbol, you don't have to be so dogmatic that it has to just be one way. And I'll give you a close example of that with Norfolk, you know, the mermaid. Eight out of 10 residents in Norfolk say the mermaid is their symbol. Yeah. I say, that's great, don't blow up this symbol, but let anybody do what they want with the mermaid. Have mermaid murals that are crazy, even avant-garde, like, 
semi, I gotta talk about this, it's just too edgy, right? But do that so it just gets even more traction, especially for younger people. No younger person is gonna want to paint this. Right? But they are going to want to paint some kind of cool rainbow coalition of mermaids that just swam up last night. Yes. Right? So with Charlotte, though, back to Marcus, hey, you still need to have this as a symbol for your guys, your 8,000 people that work, but just put city of, or do charlotte.gov, and so they're doing both of those, so they can still maintain their brand, but they're letting this idea be bigger to unify the city of Charlotte. So that's the first thing. Find that message and that narrative and get a symbol that really everybody can get behind. And we're going to come back and start brainstorming for, for, for this region in a minute. But then fuel positive buzz is the second, when you look at that wheel of traits, the second of the two pillars for place marketing. And, and this really is scaling word of mouth, if you will. So Memphis, what is Memphis known for? Come on, there are two things. Barbecue, yes. barbecue yes. And, and, and Elvis, to be specific. Yes. Right? Yes. But they want to be a little broader than that. They don't want to get rid of Elvis and barbecue. But boy, wouldn't it be nice if it was really known for Elvis and music of all kind? Yes. Wouldn't it be nice if it was known for a lot of other wonderful, you know, the home of soul and, and all kinds of things, right? Stacks Yeah, exactly. And I, you know, I, my daughter went to Rhodes, so I got to go there all the time. She, she'd always say, whose parents come and just go to all these events on campus? You spend all your time in the city. And I'm like, well, I like, it's a cool place. Yeah. And I took her, too. We were going to juke joints, dancing on the table. She goes, my friends don't do this. I'm like, that's fine. But, but this campaign, four business guys got together and said, we got to get our act together. We don't have any local pride. We don't, we, people don't have a favorable attitude about us. So they put their own money in, started a 501c3, uh, and, and, and created a marketing campaign, We Are Memphis. And it, and it manifested itself in this idea about We Are Memphis, Bring Your Soul. And they showcased the people of Memphis doing all kinds of things beyond barbecue and Elvis. What really got people excited about this and they went and recruited ambassadors, just like Richmond's doing right now, just like Nashville does. And they got them in a big room and trained them and gave them a message sheet and said, go out and get people to participate in this big website that we have. Get everybody telling our story that we're more than barbecue in Elvis. And I love research. It's what I do for a living. And when I look at these scores, it's great that in a year they increase favorability of Memphis across the country by, by uh, opinion leaders. But the best news here is this campaign really got local traction and got people to think this is a pretty good place to live and work. That's an amazing increase in, in a year. And that's what this is about. It's like, golly, man, RVA, when RVA came out, at first the regional governments, everybody's like, I'm not sure about this, right? But then once we had 10,000 bumper stickers and restaurants and people started using it, what happened is it changed the culture in Richmond. I grew up in Richmond. My parents have been there for hundreds of years. I mean, I'm just a, I am in Richmond. <laughs> Married someone from Norfolk, thankfully, so I live here too. But in Richmond, the old joke was, how many Richmonders does it take to change a light bulb? And the answer is four. One to do it, and then three to talk about how great that old light bulb was. <laughs> That's really the way it was. And so now, every time you see RVA, it becomes a cultural flag. So what comes right after that? It's always positive. And so people want the glass to be half full. So they're going, oh, what's this about? Oh, cool, there's going to be this art show. Oh, cool, there's this or that. So it really has changed their mindset in Richmond. And that's what's happening in Memphis. So that's part of what we have to do is get our story down, get people excited, understanding the why, and then becoming part of our a growing apostle movement. And so you look on social media across Hampton Roads. This is Norfolk. These are the people in Norfolk that were really ambassadors to Norfolk without any, any conviction in terms of us asking them to do it. We got them all to come to a room and join the ambassadors of Norfolk and train them with the place map and had nonprofits come and talk. This is what's going on at the price for. This is going on, by the way, here's all this photography. So they could start talking about Norfolk in a more organized way. And that's what's happening in city after city.
in Nashville, it's called Soundcheck. In Richmond, companies pay to send workers to the tourism office to go through training to become ambassadors. So we need to be, the, why make it up? I mean, if there's a process that works, follow the process and a great idea as many fathers. So this is just some of the things where we need to get to. Um, and now Columbus, if you go to this website, A, you don't really know who is actually behind this website, but it's all about getting the world as excited about Columbus as we are. And there are literally places in this website that you can copy, copy that's excellently, just remarkably well written about what Columbus is. So if you're an HR director and you want a paragraph, you just take it right off of the site. Oh, better yet, if you want some videos to put in your recruitment video, just take it right off the site. It's free. Or you want photography that already has releases from the people in it. So in our case, we're not going to just want to show people having a good time. We want to show diverse people having a good time on the water, putting their arms around the military or wherever we end up. But these are the resources that are available. And just about Jack's site, you know, look at that. They do the same thing. Columbus, this is the, that site I talked about before. So there is a process, and there are best practices. So now I'm going to take us to the third section, and then we're going to get to, to your input. The third section is really our process that we're doing for Hampton Roads. And this is just going to be a five-minute section, but I just want to show you all the steps. And as Bob said, we're at step one and a half of ten. But I'm going to stop real quick and see if we have any more questions about what's going on around the country in place marketing. Are you all familiar with all of this? Place marketing? Some of it? Okay. Yes, sir? I have a concern in this presentation. And it goes back to Mr. Martin's comment about sea level rise. I'm interested to know what sort of time window is responsible because if you're talking about bringing other people here, at some point in time, and I don't know what point that is, but worst case scenario says by 2035, we can have a serious sea level rise problem that is not built into the current plans. It could be cataclysmic sea level rise. And so if you're going to invite people here, encourage them to come here, and then they are facing the prospect of being washed away, what time window can this erosion work in that is not irresponsible. That is above my pay grade. <laughs> that is a great question. We have a brilliant it's, a, it's a great question, but it's um, <laughs> oh, somebody else. <laughs> okay, I'm not talking for the core. <laughs> uh, they can be as political as, as anybody else, but sea level rise, you've got it's being measured by altimetry and satellites, and the error is two, two plus or minus two centimeters, okay? Yep. Uh, you're, you're, you know, sea level rise globally, the best knowledge we've got is 1.6 to 1.8 millimeters a year. So you're looking at six to eight inches a century. If you can't survive that, it has more to do with Darwinian evolution than it is with actual uh, consequences of sea level rise. Yep. Our problem here is relative sea level rise. When you had a mile high glaciers, you, you had the center of the country depressed and the outliers, the coastal areas popped up. So you've got isostatic you know, recovery. So in our case, it was falling basically four inches a, a century. You've got the subsidence, which is, which is your biggest issue. Uh, Bims reports, I, I'm a, I read the, all the bills that come in uh, for uh, GNP party for the uh, General Assembly that have to do with environmental and all that sort of stuff. They've been doing that for a few years. And the panic out there is, is ridiculous. Uh, the, the truth factor went out the window. It's a religion more than, than, than facts that people are reacting to. But subsidence is big. It's going to be eight, eight to ten inches a century. Uh, when we're built on, on coastal areas, marshy soils, all that sort of stuff, 
And you've got compressible, Virginia Beach is sitting on 10,000 vertical feet of sediment, and it's compressing, it's subsiding. Uh, the biggest factor probably is groundwater withdrawal, and we have to address that. Uh, but we're taxing the entire world to solve your problem, but CO2 is not a problem, never was. You put, uh, you take a Pepsi out of the, out of the fridge, you pop the top, you put it on a table, what do you hear? You hear effervescing. That's CO2 coming out. Why is it coming up? Because it's warming. You've got 38 gigatons of uh, carbon dioxide uh, in, in the world as a mass balance. 95% of it's tied up in the oceans. So you start heating up the oceans, CO2 starts coming out. It always has. CO2 doesn't drive the temperature. CO2 is the result of the temperature increase and it's all cyclic. So get rid of the panic. But you, you realistically, you may have to plan on perhaps 20, on the coastal areas, 20 inches a century. That is not an insignificant amount when you're talking. So you don't build at base flood elevations on your NFIP maps. You build at 30 inches above if, you, if you're talking about structure that you want to last for 100 years. Uh, my son buys all these old houses that are, I don't think he's bought one that's under 100 years old out in Oklahoma. And he, and he turns them around, whatever. I mean, houses, you know, they may have a, a, a life value of, oh, 50 years. You know, the enterprise was supposed to last 25 years. I was on it in the shipyard when it got 30, and they didn't decommission until 50. So you, these things are going to stay around a long time. But all these areas are local initiatives that are going to have to be dealt with, with local, you know, building codes, standards, and whatever, and, and taxing the world on and CO2 and all this sort of stuff is, is, you know, it's distracting. The developers want you to believe that it's someone else's problem, that we don't have anything to do with it. <coughs> but when you start requiring uh, things like no net runoff from a construction site with pre and post, uh, you know, hydrographic modeling, Bud's an expert on that, you can do it. Well, you might have to have swales, you might have to have cisterns, you might have to have it, whatever. But when you've got these developers making sure all, all your runoff goes into problems, you know, and runs down the street and, and causes flooding. I, I was chair of a, of a, uh, down in, in Whalehead, North Carolina. I've got a house there, so I'm, I'm chair. We made ourselves a drainage development <coughs> sub, uh, subdivision. And we paid, with a tax rate, we tax ourselves, we have 750 properties, and we paid $8.3 million. We brought in Moffitt and Nichols First, we're going to try to get Irene was flooded. We had so many houses that had to be elevated. And it, was it part of it was our uh, building in our own area? You know, the four bedroom, three bedroom places got replaced by six and seven bedroom places. The impermeable surface increased. All the water ran off. It's got no place to go. We thought we were going to pump it into the, uh, into the dunes. The clay contact was too high. The water wouldn't go out. So what we did is we ended up having to do, uh, took out all the east-west streets there nine of them, no, excuse me, 12 of them, and made them rain basins with collection pipes underneath them and took them three miles away to a, a lake that did not have a hydro, hydro, uh, logic connection to the Abermoral Sound. But I mean, we had to fix those ourselves. Was Part of it was our problem, but a lot of it was the development on Route 12 and all the groundwater flow by the modeling was going northwest to southeast <coughs> right into our area. It goes up against the dunes. The dunes have a high clay content and turn into a bathtub. Mm -hmm. So I'll, you know, there's, it's expensive, but you're gonna have to fix your own problems and carbon taxes aren't the way to go. Okay, I, I think we need to, to get back here because yeah. we're going low on time. But thank you, that was very useful. And um, solving our problems may be one of the positive things we could advertise. Yeah, well, the <laughs> so, fact that we're facing it. Yeah, okay. the story. The story is part yeah. of the story. I just threw out, um, Madam Chair, I know you're probably about 30 minutes to have to wrap up. Yeah. John, I would really, um, this, every session is awesome, he has. I would love to hear their input. Yeah. I wonder if that would be possible to John. I know you had some questions for, yeah. for the CTAC. I, I don't mean to no. jump into your presentation, but I. Love to hear their reactions to sure. those questions. So we have three three primary questions that I'll just jump to. Um, just allow me sixty seconds to go through this, just to let you see. We've seen this process. The back of the handout 
is the detailed 10 step process the region's going through to arrive at our messaging and how to share it and the implications for the region. And so I was just going to take you through this, the idea that this has really been going on for some time, that we're really going to develop an understanding of what a reputation is and then where should we go from here. But we've got to make this inclusive. So we have a task force that's been organized. And you guys will have copies of these slides, but this is the central task force managing this process. We also have um, a, 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 a stakeholders group with 200 different groups on it that are providing input. And then the young professionals, we've unified 17 young professional groups across the entire region to be part of this and all their members. So they're going to be providing a lot of input into this process. And we have a website that's been built that allows you to really follow the whole process and all the studies that we do. It's called uh, Envision 2020. It's envisioning2020.com. And then we're starting by looking at all the studies that have been done to date, including the, the Planning District Commission. And, and a couple of years ago, they did a study, and 17% of the people say, yeah, I say I'm from Hampton Roads. 61% identify with Hampton Roads. So Hampton Roads is not off the table in terms of an ultimate name. We should look at the current name and understand what is the equity in it, both positive and negative. And then we ought to think about trends, and we do an awful lot of work here, so we're going to provide a, a trends assessment on what's shaping cities and regions of the future. And then we're doing a social media audit right now, and we're saying what are people using when they describe our name? Notice San Diego, a lot of comments nationally come out about Hampton Roads from San Diego because of the military. 757 is the number one hashtag, number one name that people use, slang name about our region. And then we're looking at our peer cities, and this is Hereta's list, but we're building on that by looking at all these other dimensions. And then auditing what other cities are doing, like a Columbus and like a Pittsburgh. What are our peer cities doing? And then based on all that, coming up with hypotheses on what is the equity in our current name? What are some new names we should test? And then going into primary research. And in the primary research, we're going to talk to residents across the region, businesses across the region, prospective travelers up and down the East Coast, corporate real estate executives, moving companies, and site selection consultants. It's going to be a huge 360 kind of evaluation when we get to the primary research stage. And the residents across the region, when we did Norfolk's work, we had 2,000 people, Fort Worth. You can see that we really want to say three or 4,000 people participated. When we get to that point, we're not there yet. We're just in the first couple of stages. But then we arrive at this optimal communication strategy that brings the position to light that then addresses these other things. So we're going to do nine different studies. We're up here in the first two right now. Um, and it ultimately gets to our recommendations and key findings on what's our reputation and where do we go from here? Where do we go from here and what do we do? And so the criteria that we're going to bring to the table is, is our ultimately the name decision, is it strategic? Is it place oriented? Can you just look at it and go, oh, I know where that is. We don't have time to teach people. And then, does it work for all the jurisdictions or most of them? Is it unique and differentiating? And can it, can it be adopted relatively uh, simply? So it might be Hampton Roads. It might be Hampton Roads with a tagline that's geographically oriented. It might be a new name with a tagline. But we're going to see in testing, what do people think when they hear this? Do they associate it with Virginia, Eastern Virginia? And then maybe it ends up being a multiple kind of execution where there's a tourism name and then a social media slang name and then the official designation. We don't know until we do all this research where we're going to be. But I don't want people to think it's versus Tidewater versus Coastal Virginia. You've got to have Hampton Roads as a candidate now until we do all this research. But it's going to get sophisticated fast and you're going to hear different people saying different things about this, but now you've seen the whole process. It is a whole process. And we really need to start here with the inputs. So when we think about this, um, I'm going to go to the end here. Bob reference, we're in a, we've got three questions that we want your input on. And the first one is, you know, what is our unique story at Hampton Roads? When you think about it, we've got into some discussion here, but when you tell people why they should come here, what, what do you say is unique about this place versus other places? And what are some symbols and icons? We're going to test these in research across all those audiences. We're going to say, what symbols do you think represent it? But we're going to do it open-ended. What symbols represent the region? But then we want to have a closed-ended question where we say, pick the ones that you think most represent. And so we've got to get that list put together. So that's why I'm asking you to provide input on these first two. And the third one is, what names have you heard? We've heard a lot of different names. We want to do our 
sophisticated modeling in our, in our survey, the way it's designed, we want to rotate different names and test different names and taglines. So we want to make sure we have a complete list. So these are the three. If we could spend time in the last 15 minutes, that would be great. And just take each one at a time, these three questions, and y'all give us input. Bob, you want to build on that? Yeah, I think uh, I'd love just to sit back and listen. Um, I, I get to tell you, John and I last Friday were in a room with a little over 100 people, and uh, it was interesting. We, we heard some response to these questions, John, I had not thought about previously, right? So, and I'm sure I'd be curious, interested in CTAC's um, react, initial feedback to, to some of these questions and discussion. Okay, well, the floor is open. So question number one, what is Hampton Road's unique story? Does, does the historical aspect of our region have any legs? I love America's first region. That certainly gets us out to Jamestown and Williamsburg. And even if it doesn't zero in somebody from across the country on exactly our location, I just, I, I love the historical aspect. There's no other first landing. Mm -hmm. Picking up on that same thought, I was thinking that what makes us, this region unique is from the birth of a nation, Jamestown, to interplanetary exploration. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, that really does set us apart from the rest of the country. Anyone else? Come on, everybody, wake up. I think the. Uh, the, 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 the tie to the maritime industry as well as just our connection to the coast and the waterways. I think that's hugely important. I don't think you find that in a lot of other places around the country. Uh, I think the uh, what you mentioned in your presentation about us having being sort of multipolar. We have fairly significant cities, not just one big city, but we have different cities. And if you could capitalize on that, and I, I, I don't like Tidewater or Coastal Virginia. I don't think they fit. Tidewater is a geographical uh, uh, name that applies to New Coastal New Jersey, South Carolina, a lot of places along the Atlantic Coast. We're not Tidewater particularly. And Coastal Virginia, the tourists, the people at the beach like it, but uh, I don't think it fits the entire region. I like your Hampton Roads. Hampton Roads is, is not perfect, but it's, it's it's been around a long time. We've got a lot of equity in it. Yeah. And maybe you could figure out a way to build on that, as you suggested. Hampton Roads with subtitles. Hampton Roads Norfolk, Hampton Roads Virginia Beach, something like that. Smarter than that. But We're way for everybody to tie into that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Scott? Yeah, I didn't grow up here. The Navy brought me here, too. I grew up in New England, Connecticut. And spent some time in Florida. So from a tourism perspective, um, if you look at Florida or you look at New England, uh, if you've never been in any of those places, they have very extreme weather. Florida is like eight months, 90 degree, 95 degree weather. New England, we have very long winters, very cold winters. This is like the perfect place. You get the best of both worlds, um, but there's not one extreme or another. You have the coast, and in like what two hours you can be skiing in the mountains. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's like the East Coast, uh, California on the East Coast. Oh, I like that. <laughs> Maritime uniqueness and in invention: the first dry dock, first aircraft carrier, first um, ironclad, all mm. coming out of this area. Mm. But um, did what everybody else said, what I want to add to it, this is a, a great place with, for um, a well-educated um, population. We have William and Mary, we have several community colleges, we have ODU, we have Norfolk State, uh, Hampton University. So we're in the middle of all that education and we have to leverage that yeah. uh, somehow. Whether we're going to be a, a research place where we're birthing, George, my friend George here mentioned that we don't sort of grow our entrepreneurs. We need to do that. Seattle does that. Yeah. Um, that was one of the first uh, interregional visits the Chamber did. And that's one of the things they take pride in, that they birth uh, businesses and, and they nurture them. And I think we need to do a better job of, of uh, 
promoting entrepreneurship, um, leveraging the technology that's here, um, all of those sorts of things. With all of this higher education institutions all around us, I don't think we've done a good job of leveraging those resources. But I'm real quick, I'm sorry, Gary. On the other end of that spectrum, we've got such a wealth of talent in our military who are either getting out of the military yep. or our military spouses who are here because of their attachment to the military and they want to open a, a business or they want to do something um, executive level or, or not. Yep. Um, we've got such a wealth of talent that is getting out of the military and, and, and really has executive mm -hmm. skill sets that we can use in the business world. Okay. Yeah, yeah I think also uh, along the same lines, uh, you know, I've, lived, I've lived in Atlanta for a long period of time, my farm just my part in the area in, in, in the country, but every time I go back there, you know, I, I wave my hands at them because they're landlocked. Right. There's, there's no water, there's no beach, right. there's no waterways, you know, nothing like that. Actually, they are extremely jealous of that. So, water from, from, from the perspective of industry, and there's a long history is associated with that from, from, from a recreational perspective yeah. as well, uh, gives us the uh, yeah. uh, diversity that, that, that we need, which sets us apart from the good we're on here. Also, in, 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 terms of, in terms of affordability as well. Our housing prices are still somewhat reasonable, uh, and, and other ec economic costs are still within the uh, grasp. So, affordability is, is also great. Go ahead. It, it's interesting you talk about the water. Um, one of the first trips that I made when I went to work for the Army was a week in Indianapolis at uh, Fort Benjamin Harrison. And by the end of the week, it was a good trip. I mean, the people were great, and I accomplished what I needed to, but I just felt kind of blah. I really did. And it wasn't so much that I didn't want to be away from home. I, I just felt blah. The trip back, flying into Norfolk, I arrived in daylight, and I looked out the window, and I knew why I felt blah. There was no water. Yeah. I missed the water. Yes. And so it does make a big difference. My next trip, I went to see the White River. The bridge was a half a mile long, and the river was about as wide as this table. <laughs> <laughs> but the bridge had to be built for the flash flooding. So, but that was their water. Yeah. So Carlton, so, so think about what is what you just said, what is the essence of that. When you experience the water, it makes you feel what? What is what is the, this gift of having 10,000 miles of waterfront, whatever we have here, we need to quantify it. Being with, everywhere you look, there's water. And we hear this from a lot of people when they weigh in. What three words come to mind? Water's a big word. But what are people saying? What is life? Festive. We have yeah, all the entertainment along the water. Uh, recreation along the water. Of course, the maritime industries is is, is is big here. It's a big part of our um, economy. So there there's so many ways. But when I I felt the same way as Carlton that when I I don't like being in cities that are landlocked. Right. I, I feel there's a sense of there's a uh, sense of freedom. Yeah, it's yeah. It's, 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 it's yeah it's it's freedom. It's 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 also it's life because it's life for industries, uh, fishermen. They're they're folks who make their livelihood on the eastern shore from it. Mm -hmm. And we have our military, and we have the port. There's so many things. Our lifeblood is uh, our lifeblood is water. Absolutely. We really need to market the, the natural resource that exists. I've lived here my entire life, so I've seen amazing changes. But the opportunity that still exists in this region is that you can live in the country, you can live remotely, you can live in a very quiet, subdued environment. You can get to the city, you can get to the beach, or you can live in the city or live in the beach. So the opportunity for the quality of life that you're seeking yeah. exists. Yeah. And we and that's and we really should market that because there's I think we'll always continue to have humans that that are looking for that diversity and lifestyle. Yeah, definitely. Even more so that, that want to raise their families in a quiet um, remote, you know, more country setting, and, and there, we do have a lot of land 
you know, we are we are we have great resources in this region. We really do. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say to you that I grew up in New Jersey, um, right two houses from the ocean, from the Jersey Shore. And um, the only reason I accepted this job was I came down here and I realized it was the ocean. If it wasn't, I wouldn't have taken this job. Yeah. So having grown up on the ocean, and I just want to give you some words like this. I think it's grounding. Yeah. Right? It's very grounding. It's also very humbling. And I think that it speaks to all possibilities. It's, re it's a renewal because every time the water comes in and goes out, it's a whole new day. Every time. Now you're talking. Right. Yeah. And so for me, um, to avoid getting big head, we won't get into reasons why, but to avoid getting big head, it's so important for me to spend time on the water because of those reasons. It Perfect. keeps you in check. You know? Yeah. So that's one. Yeah. I want to move on to the next question, but that's what I want y'all to think about. Right. The email the feeling, right? What's the feeling that the water gives you? Right. Because we we have this. It's in our DNA. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's something in the water. Right? <laughs> so what, what does it really mean to you? And I, I tell you, my friends, because I, I get to live in both markets. If I go out in public in Richmond on the weekends, my friends and the parties that I go to, I have to shave. I don't in Hampton Roads. <laughs> what is that? What does that mean? It's a, bit, and it's a little more casual here. It speaks to us. It's a little more, it's not a resort, but it's kind of like laid back. It does. Laid back. It does. It does. So, so think about this and send, send me emails and send Bob emails about what does it really mean to you? Ask your family, what does the water really mean to us here? That's what we want to answer. So let's move on to the second question. Delcino was hitting around it, but I think something that doesn't get its full due is the spectrum of water resources that we have. It's yes. not just the ocean waves right. lapping yeah. up on yeah. the beach. Yeah. We've got bulkheaded ferry trips from Norfolk to Portsmouth and back again. We've got inland waterways where you can live yeah. on either a, a beach line or yeah. a bulkhead line. Yeah. It seems like every neighborhood, because of where we are elevation-wise, has a lake or a pond that you can go out and When it rains, it's really... So this is one I want everybody to just spend 30 seconds writing down, and then we're going to go around. Think about symbols that represent the region. Right? So just think about a symbol or, or an icon. That you said, you know, much like the crown in Charlotte, what's our crown? And there's no right answer here. But what are some things when you see it, you go, oh yeah, that's Hampton Roads, that's us. What if, so I'm going to give you quiet time for 60 seconds and then we'll go around the table. Symbols that represent images or symbols or iconology that represent our region. Love, 
that goes yeah. that's um, placed in a lot of yeah. placing points in the region <laughs> because <laughs> Virginia is <laughs> yeah. so. yeah, I would say sun, sun. sail, sun and sail, wave, wave. I said boat, but I was also thinking in a military boat, like an aircraft carrier, because uh, they are so easy to spot. But I also had actually seagulls, because you will find them in the parking lot, <laughs> and you will find them at the beach. Yes. They truly are a regional yep. item. Yep. <laughs> I said anchor, waves, sunshine, flag, ships, and then something that shows equal togetherness. Traffic. John. Clipper ship, then the mermaid, King Neptune, and HR. <coughs> What's H HR? Uh, tunnels, wave, ship. We already said mermaid. We already said King Neptune. Pelican, seagull, dolphin, striper, or some other fish. <laughs> seven five seven. Good. Yeah. I'm going to repeat what I saw there's waves and sailboats and uh, pelican flight over the waves. Mm. Uh, dolphin, mermaid, waves, um, the education towers, a lot of the universities use those, the towers as their icon, and sails. Mm. Waves. Um, and I also think of it always comes to me, the 757, because that's how a lot of times I communicate. You know, like if I'm in Richmond, or I'll say, you know, the 757. Yeah. So that's how I communicate to, you know, a lot of folks that I come in contact. But I also think of the waves. I think of um, the maritime symbol, um, since I'm from Newport News. Um, and just uh, visualizing a lot of waves in the 757, that's what just pops into my head right now. Good. Christian? Um, I had the mermaid, which a lot of people love. Uh, lighthouse, the duck in the pig. And sail. You look at Virginia Beach and Norfolk from the satellite image. Virginia Beach is a duck and Norfolk is a pig. Oh, oh the, the shape on the, the map. Okay. Yeah, okay. Oh, it looks like a duck. It does. The map of Virginia Beach, if you look at the map, it does look like a duck. I've been trying to think. <laughs> <laughs> and as a last one, not, not really the last one, but. Um, Y'all said everything, but I do, I do love the idea of the sail. Um, that's one of the things that I have loved doing. I had a sailboat until my brother-in-law pulled out of it. But anyway, that's another story. But I um, loved it. I loved the sailing, Chesapeake Bay, uh, the lighthouse. I just always love the lighthouse, the ones up the coast and the ones right here. Um, and we have, you know, the First landing, like I said earlier, I think history yep. is absolutely phenomenal. But nobody has said anything about our great George Washington, our first president mm -hmm. who dug the dismal swamp ditch. Now I don't know how that would make everybody excited about it, but it is really a big item. Yeah. 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 I mean, oh, um, yeah. Mitchell Biden said, but um, a couple of new ones. Um, Harbor Fest, and we just had Harbor Fest recently, but that energy and the seafood and the liveliness on the water with the tall ships. I know that Norfolk used the tall ships, but maybe yeah. a combo with that. Um, the seafood, the crab. Um, WRV, I wear my WRV shirt when I travel, and people always come to are you from Virginia Beach? Yeah, so it is a recognizable icon, and we can't use that, but I like that acronym, you know, the RDA. Um, DB, DB Strong, that really has resonated 
a lot of people. And the 757, I agree with you on the 757, but I just read somewhere that we're getting another year. Yeah. Yeah. So that's not going to help us. The original. The original. Oh, yeah, the original. All right. Thank you. Do either of you have anything you'd like to add? We should listen. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I can't believe nobody met it as the beach from the beach, beach ball and beach umbrella. Nobody yeah. says that. Yeah. I know. I, it's interesting that so many of the things that are dealing with water are the beach. Yeah, that's right. but, but as a native of Williamsburg, which is a part of the region, yes. those symbols will not particularly resonate exactly. on the Upper Peninsula. So, but the seagull does fly. <laughs> so, Thompson, you're, you're actually hitting right on the whole theme for the day. You've got to be on strategy. And so, if water is part of the strategy, then what symbol works? What name works? The treatment of the color of the name. And then, does it work for everybody? Exactly. So you that's why this is a much more complicated way. thing than what it was like to call it. Yeah. The way it's in the way it's in the form of the hat. All right, this has, been, this has been a few minutes on the last question. I'm sorry, John, after one hour. Sorry. Um, my list had everything everybody said. But the one thing I wondered is, um, there's a patriotism here yes. that I think is so ingrained with the water. And John, I wonder if our bald eagle doesn't somehow help convey that. Mm -hmm. and I, so I just threw that out there as an icon. Yeah. You know, patriotism, I think, is something that's really ingrained here and, and connects with the water, too. So I just throw that one out. Good. All right, the last question. We've heard a lot of different names. It's got to be on strategy, but we're going to move towards getting to the research phase. And we really are going to bring some sophistication to this, that we have a, a lot of different devices. We do name testing for companies and, and such. So we just want to make sure we got all the names covered. We know all the, the obvious ones. We've heard Coastal Virginia and Time Work. Are there any other ones that, that you are hearing beyond, we've said 757, any other names for this region that, that you said, boy, you, you, you got to make sure you include that in your, in your testing? Well, growing up um, in Williamsburg, the historic triangle, which covers Jamestown, Williamsburg, and Yorktown, yeah. and that's been in use for decades. Mm -hmm. I've heard Greater Norfolk, which I don't think sounds really good, but I've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, John, uh, there was a marketing campaign for years for the airport wharf. So that's the key, that's the airport symbol for the right. for, for the airport. Mm -hmm. And a lot of a lot of cities do this. Yeah. Yeah. So just just steal it from Jax, I guess. But what's a what's a orf, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 What's orf? What's orf? Some some uh, nonprofits in the area say southeastern Virginia. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's right. So. Yeah. 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 We've heard that. Yes. Yeah. 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 city. They call it Siva. Siva. Yeah. Right. Right. I, do, I, I just want to say that what I find interesting is that when people talk about water, they automatically go to ocean, right. and it's not. Right. Mm -hmm. And the characteristic that I love here is I live on the waterway, the intercoastal waterway, mm -hmm. right by the you know, Great Bridge, right there. Mm -hmm. Ships all day. And that is, it's not near the ocean. So I think mm -hmm. that if there was a way to capture water without ocean that would be and so to your point the quality of that is what the answer is because even when i go my fiance lives in williamsburg we're in the water we True. go to the water we fish we're on the water we take the boat yeah. out we just help. yeah try um one of the one of the things that uh just because somebody mentioned bridge uh, bridges as a symbol um and there is now a section of the virginia pilot a section called bridges that that is for portsmouth chesapeake and suffolk and bridges also represents the communication between people and the diversity of, you know, bridging the gaps between us yeah. and the connections yeah. and stuff. So yeah. I think yeah. that's, you know, symbolically that's an interesting... And John, the obvious ones too, we, we separate ourselves by saying Peninsula and Southside. Right. So many of us say, well, Lord, you know, have a meeting on the Peninsula. They won't say Newport News or Hampton, they'll just say the Peninsula and, and vice versa. I'm going to the South Side. And then yeah. some people, um, even our chambers, the Hampton Roads sort of 
um, communicate South Side versus Peninsula. Even right. our chambers are, are named such That's because right. it's the uh, what is it? The Greater Peninsula Chamber, Virginia Peninsula, Virginia Chamber. Peninsula Chamber, and Hampton Roads Chamber. Right. So just and then there are others in between. Okay. Williamsburg has its own. So just wanted to put that out there Good. too. Okay. Well, you got one over there. And one of the more esoteric names that shows difference in perspective, greater metropolitan Congo. <laughs> <laughs> there was a string band that used that name. That's funny. I'm embarrassed I don't know. What, what was the effort behind America's First Region? Was that? Um, well, the Hampton Road 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 that was the anniversary of A lot of that grew out of Herb Bateman, who used to refer to Virginia's first region because he was from the first district yes. in Virginia. Yes. And, and that goes back many, many years right now. Well, that's great, and I, I appreciate you guys, um, your energy right after lunch, and, and really all your great questions. And I didn't have time to take you through this, but we're going to study through this research, not only sort of the positioning strategy and naming, but we're, we know the attributes that people use and their expectation for a region or a home. And, and we, when we work with cities and regions, We'll use these in, in questions to get people to rate. And one of those attributes, of the 12 defining attributes of a place, is really mobility and tra transportation. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to get people to rate how important that is here, but also how well we're delivering on that. So not only the expectation, but the performance. And so you're going to see this when we come back and share the research. For the naming, you're also going to see information that's going to help you think about placemaking, and in particular, mobility and transportation. So it's going to be a really good benchmark. How do we improve this over time? But then we're also going to give that information sorted by young professionals, millennials, and they're going to look at that. And so you're going to see what's important to them, expectation and performance. And they're going to use that in their planning. So you're going to, you're going to quickly see that part of marketing this region and telling the story also involves what you guys are charged to do. And I think that's really exciting. So thank you for the honor of coming here and talking to you today. Can I ask you a question real quickly? Just in terms of what CTAC does and their connection. So you know that they're a representative from their locality. And then they go back to their localities and talk about what happened here. Can we establish a relationship with you? We do by virtue of Bob, but yeah. where we know where, where you're going to be in the region and who sure. you're talking to and how it's going. And yeah. I did write down the website. I'd actually like to put together, you know, this this, this initiative, yeah. a packet for CTAC members so that they Perfect. can stay connected. Love it. Okay, we'll talk. Love it. Okay. Okay, okay. 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 they'll Thank include you. access to this, uh, some of the slides. So yes. Sure. You yeah. will yeah. get an email tomorrow with a link. We will upload Perfect. it. We'll get everything and the video of the meeting. Okay. Which is happening. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. That was that was awesome. Yeah. Do this for another two hours. <laughs> Except we're all tired. <laughs> and worn out from all these lunches. Um we have more meetings. Okay, uh, does anybody have any thing they'd like to say about older new business? As a future discussion topic. Um, that $5 billion worth of construction projects that we are funding on locally raised revenue has destroyed and will destroy acres of trees. And I would like, as a conversation topic uh, at a future meeting, whether there should be a tree replacement program Institute. Okay. 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 Okay.